10. We was at off uh, 24-7 off uh, Davidson. Yeah, so that was a long time ago. But we still yet going, though. Turn with me your Bibles to Psalms 139. Let's get right into today's discussion. I won't be before you guys too long. We're going to get right into our exercise this evening. Um, but for those who are brand new, we do integrate social media with our discussion, so definitely get your phones out. If you hear anything that resonates with you that you're like, I need all my people online to know, definitely utilize the hashtag, why am I here? So tonight's hashtag is why am I here? So if you hear anything, any quotes, any sayings from the, from the group as well as myself that you feel like everyone needs to know, definitely feel free to utilize that hashtag. But on your tables, there's, there's multiple kind of cards. This card right here is for questions. So if you have any questions that you may have throughout the whole night, uh, feel free to write your questions on this card here. And there's a little small little bucket in the back, so drop your questions in there, and we're going to give about 10 minutes for Q&A. Also, this white card on your table is just for your memory verse, and the memory verse is right here on the paper here. We won't go over our memory verse for time's sake, um, but for those who are new, this is your first time here, we're going over the whole chapter of Psalms 139. So for those who were here last week, we memorized verses 1 and 2. And this week we want to focus on verses three and four. So Miss Alicia had taken the time to write so eloquently, I see, of our verse on the wall. So that's our memory verse. So the white piece of paper is just a paper where you can put on your mirror, put beside your bed rest, and just say, God, I just want to take some time to memorize your word. But, <clears throat> and also, you have a flyer on your table. Uh, unfortunately, next week will be our last unplug for this year. We'll be back up. Miranda looked around and said, what you mean last time? <laughs> wow, that's beautiful right there, man. Shade of tail. Well, we're going to be back January 7th <laughs> right here in this room. Um, so we want you to invite people out next week. Unfortunately, we won't be in this room because someone else will be here, so we'll be in a big room. Um, so, that, so we'll be in a big room. But this is our workshop room, so feel free to relax. Feel free to engage. I'm only going to be before you 15 minutes, and then we're going to get right into our exercise. Let's get right into a Psalms 139. I'm going to read the whole chapter, <clears throat> and then we're going to get right into the person of God. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. <clears throat> Excuse me. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day. Your darkness is as light with you, <clears throat> for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. When I was yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast. Oh, I missed my verse. Where I'm at. For you formed my inward parts, you formed me together in my mother's womb. What's up, y'all? You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they, would, they are more than the sand, and I awake and I am still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God, O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you so much for who you are, man. I appreciate you for being the God who is a friend to me. And I pray, Lord, as I speak today, I speak eloquently. And I not even necessarily eloquently, but powerful. God, that every word that I speak will rest on their hearts, Father God, that will be planted in their soul throughout the week, hope, hoping that they'll bear fruit throughout the coming week. God, I pray as we talk about who you are, I pray that we gather wisdom, we gather insight, because, God, you want to be our friends, God. And we thank you for this time. 
In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. There's three questions that we're going to talk about tonight. So if you're writing and taking notes, these three questions. Question number one, how does God's holiness affect my Christian walk? <clears throat> Question number one, how does God's holiness affect my Christian walk? The second question, I'll repeat them. Why does it matter to me that God is unchanging? Question number two again, why does it matter to me that God is unchanging? Question number three, why is it important for God to want us and not need us? Question one, how does God's holiness affect my Christian walk? Question number two, why does it matter to me that God is unchanging? <clears throat> Excuse me. And number three, why is it important for God to want us and not need us? You repeat them again? I got you. Hey, what's up, y'all? My name's Josh, by the way. Gigi, what's up, Gigi? What's up, bro? What's... Uh, Cecil. Cecil? Tyler. Tyler, how did you hear about us? That's what's up, man. Welcome. Let's welcome our first time. Thank y'all for, for coming out. She's like, y'all stop looking at me. Um, number one, how does God's holiness affect my Christian walk? Number two, why does it matter to me that God is unchanging? And number three, why is it important for God to want us and not need us? So tonight we're going to talk about three attributes of God. God's holiness, God's ability to not change, and number three, his ability to be self-sufficient. Holy unchanging, self-sufficient. <clears throat> I want to take my time, make sure you guys get all those notes down. Question, Question number three is, why is it important for God to want us and not need us? So basically number one is God's holiness. Number two is God's ability to not change or unchangingness. Is that a word? Is that another word, Alicia? She's our teacher. She's... <laughs> Um, uh, just put unchanged for number two. <clears throat> and number three, he's self-sufficient. Y'all ready? Let's talk about God being holy. Let's look at 1 Peter, verses 15, verse Peter 1, 15 through 16. The text reads, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The beautiful thing about God's holiness is that God's not trying to imply for us to be perfect. God, in his essence of him being holy, means he's extremely set apart, meaning that he is so set apart that <clears throat> he is so distinct that no other person can be God. He's holy. But what God implies us for be when a text says, be holy for I am holy, he's given us the human uh, definition of what it means to be holy, which means to be set apart. Being set apart is very important because the world is looking for a distinction. Right now in the America that we live in right now, it's very imperative for you to know what you or who you believe in. Because right now it's being set, this line has been set in the sand for you and I to distinguish or determine who is it that I'm going to believe. Being holy does not mean that you have to be perfect. God said, I became perfect because it's imperfect. You cannot even gasp or grasp the, the, the intent of what it means to be perfect. Right now, by default, nobody right now in this room is perfect. Therefore, for preachers like myself, I don't judge people who walk in. I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you smoke. I don't care if you're sleeping around. I cannot sit there and say, I am a perfect person. I got all together, so therefore you're not perfect, so I come down judging. But the text implies that I should make it my intent to be set apart. God wants you to progress. Inside of each and every one of your hearts right now are some stuff inside of you that you have yet to address. Never avoid what you need to address. God's holiness says, you know what, since I am holy and therefore it costs me my blood for you to be saved, it costs me my life for you to be saved, it is your responsibility to say through a loving, thriving relationship with me to say, God, I'm going to set myself apart. I'm going to set myself in a distinction where people do not see or hear that I'm a Christian by what I say or what I post, but they know me as a Christian by the way I live. See, God don't care about <clears throat> how well you articulate who you are with him. He cares about how do you live it. The Bible says, for they say out of their lips that they love me, but their hearts are far from me. It's important before we are set amongst that we are set apart. God does not want us to be perfect, like I said, but he desires for us to progress. 
right now in your life, are you a different person than who you was a year ago? Are you a different person than who you are yesterday? You have the greatest gift on the inside of you, and that's the God's precious spirit. Right now inside of you, you have the power to be greater than who you are now. You have to ask yourself, what are those things in my life right now that's keeping me from progressing? What is that thing in my life right now that's keeping me from being the man that I should be? What is that a thing in my life that's keeping me from one day being a husband or the father I should be? And for you ladies, the wife or the woman or the mother you want to be, because if you do not take the time to self-examine your heart and to say, God, you are so holy, and since you want a relationship with me, you desire for me to be set apart, God, show me because I do not want anything to cause me to drift from you. God's holiness does one of two things. Either it draws you to him or it drifts you from him. Are you being drawn to him? God's holiness is not asking for you to be like, well, dang, God, you know, God don't care about the sins that you may fall into. He cares about the sins you habitually do. He cares about those things that you practice, those things that's keeping you from progressing, those things that's keeping you from tying with him. See, many of us think that bad things is what's keeping us from being holy. Sometimes it's good things that's keeping us from being holy. It's what, anytime you make a good thing a God thing, that thing's an idol. So what happens is, well, I just want to be married, or I just want to have kids, or I just want to be successful. Those are good things. Those are things that we should aspire to, to one day have, and there's nothing wrong with those things. But when those things are the center focus of your life, ladies and gentlemen, you will never be able to progress because God say, look, I'm good in heaven. I don't got no hell to be put in. <laughs> the Bible says, why fear a man who can only kill the body? He says, you better fear the one who could put your body and soul in hell. Ladies and gentlemen, he's holy, not for us to be perfect, but because of him but because he loves us, that God, you died and you told your disciples that it was expedient for you to go so that you could send the greatest gift, which is the comforter, to say, you know what, Faith, you know what, Alicia, you know what we can do? We can progress. I should not be the same Josh that I was yesterday. And I know many people are like, well, dang, bro. <clears throat> but I should be so caught up in who God is and say, God, for you, since you are holy, because if you're in a relationship with someone and you love someone, you always want to pursue the next version of them. You always want to pursue who they can be or who they will be. And since God is so vast, we can live a billion lives and never even grasp 5% of his essence. Therefore, every day when we engage with him and we spend time with him, we have the opportunity to say, God, I'm going to be a better person. Now, I'm going to tell some people in this room, some things you're not going to get over in a day. See, I struggled with pornography back in the day. It went from when God gripped my heart, it went from watching porn a lot to watching porn barely to not watching porn at all. When you engage with God, his holiness says, you know what? God's sitting there saying, you know what, champ? I ain't even going to trip on you. I know you're going to mess up next week. It's all right. You know what I'm saying? I already know. I know you're going to slip up. I know you're going to yell at somebody. I know you're going to slap somebody. It's okay. I know you got anger problems. I know you got lust problems. It's all right. God's not sitting there saying you got to sprint to the finish line. He said, no, this is a marathon, baby. We're going to take our time. And over time, you should be able to say, in three months, I should be over blank. Because when you're with someone who's set apart, you're going to be set apart as well. Before God sets you amongst the crowd, he sets you apart. Look at Moses. Moses was set apart, away from the children of Israel, to be closer to God. And from that moment, after he spent time with God, he was set amongst the people. The reason why many of us are probably not having the greatest impact amongst the people. What's up, man? You listening too, ain't you, little man? That's my little, that's Damien right there. That's my boy right there. But anyway, before he get up, before he, uh, he taking his hat off, now that's showing too much attention. I'm messing with you. But what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes God drifts you into isolation. And we get upset with God. God, he starts stripping friends out your life. That man you thought you was going to marry, he gone. That girl you thought you was going to marry, she gone. You get mad at God because he done went with somebody and got married and he done moved on. <laughs> but God said, don't, see, God sometimes tells us, don't get so caught up in what you see posted. Don't get so caught up in what you see because God says tomatoes don't grow overnight. Pineapples don't grow overnight. Cherries and fruits and nuts and, and all the, the produce of the world do not grow overnight. They're not made in an instant. Things that are good, things that are at its best takes time to be right. And God said, before I set you amongst, I isolate you. 
I want you to get to know me. I want you to love me. I want you to en engage with me so that when you are set amongst the people, bless you, when you set amongst the people, your light is brightest. Your eyes hurt when lights are dim, not when they're bright. Is your light dim? Can people even distinguish what person you are? Or is your light so radiant that they know the God you walk with? Why is it important for us to know that God is holy? Because God's holiness puts us in a place where we're set apart. God's holiness being then begins to say, okay, it's self-examining myself because the Bible talks about in John that the people avoid the lights because they didn't want their deeds to be exposed. What happens in life, many of us, when we sin or we fall, we run away from God. But God said, no, 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 when you fall, run to me. We should run to the brightest of light and say, God, if there be any iniquity, any grievance, or any great area in my life, God, remove. Are you willing to be holy? Are you willing to be set apart because he is? Number two, why does it matter to me that God is unchanging? Hebrews 13, 8, for those taking notes, says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But there's a verse that I want to read, and I know, Alicia, I'm going pressing for time, but give me 10 more minutes. Ecclesiastes 3, 14 through 15. I'm going to give you some time to turn there in your Bibles. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 3, 14 through 15. And since this is an everyday walk with God, we should always press to be a better version of ourselves. Ecclesiastes 3, 14 to 15 says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it <clears throat> nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that the people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. <clears throat> it's very important for us to understand that God does not change. When you understand that God doesn't change, that means his views on sin doesn't change, his views on the sinner doesn't change, his views on the saints don't change, his views on salvation doesn't change, and his views on his supply does never, never change. It's very important for us to understand why God doesn't change. You know why? Because I can trust that. There's security and stability when God doesn't change. We change, but God doesn't. And many times we confuse people's changing this. Uh-huh. Is that a word, Alicia? We confuse people's changing this, right? Versus God's ability to not change. So what happens is we think that God's a fair weather friend. We think God is here today, gone tomorrow. No, God is the same. When you understand that God is the same, it puts you in a place where you say, you know what, God, since you never change, show me your views about certain things. And you ladies, you know, you want to be with a man who brings security and stability, right? You don't want to be with no man who can't provide for you spiritually, physically, or emotionally. You don't want to be with a person <clears throat> who, who drifts you into a relationship and then say, oh, my bad, I don't got no money in the bank. You don't want to be with someone who, who doesn't have these certain things. There's nothing wrong with a man who's progressing there because some people get so caught up in a person's potential, but you should be caught up on how that person's getting there, right? The same thing is with God. Since God is the same, since God is secured, and since God is stable, I don't have to worry about wavering. What happens is many of us put our roots in the sand. Many of us put our roots in idols. We put our roots in people. So what happens is when the storms of life come, we begin to waver. The Bible says don't be halt between two opinions. Don't be wavering in your walk. That's why the devil wants you to be so far away, removed from God, to the point to where you fail to realize and understand the certain attributes about him that if the devil say stuff like this, what did God really say? He's been playing the same trick since he, see, since he played on Eve. When God tells you something, hold on to it. The only way you can miss out on what God told you is if you choose not to believe in what God has told you. I've told people, I've seen visions, I've seen glimpses of where I want to be, where God has showed me I'm going to be. He showed me nations, he showed me, he showed me uh, stadiums filled with people, he showed me walking amongst the jungles in Africa, he showed me in Indonesia, he showed me these different places over these 20-some years. But God said, man, I showed you this, but there's no guarantee that you'll get there. The only way you'll get there is if you follow and trust me. But throughout that journey, the devil always say, did not God, did God really say? And many of us become wavering in our opinions. But if God is sturdy and he's true, 
then no matter what he tells you, you don't have to worry about wavering. I don't care if you're a musician. I don't care if you're a poet. I don't care if you're an author. I don't care what it is that you want to be. If God spoke it, it can be brought to pass. But you have to trust him. It's tough trusting God, isn't it? <clears throat> it's tough trusting a person you cannot see. But you trust the air you cannot see. Your lungs don't be like, should we breathe today? <clears throat> you know, should I take a deep breath at this moment? No, 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 no. Your lungs don't say that because your lungs have been programmed to believe that there's air. See, we've been taught to walk by sight more than we are to walk by faith. That's why when I have kids, I'm going to teach my boys and teach my girls when I have them. Yo, walk by both, you know what I'm saying? But walk mostly by faith because God is ultimate. He is the ultimate true provider. And if we walk by sight, we'll say stuff like this. Well, since I don't see it, I don't believe it. But many people do not believe that the seed grows mostly underground. There's more roots than our branches. And if God, if you are anchored in him and you know he doesn't change, there's security and stability. Let me make sure I cover all my notes. <clears throat> in eternity, everything in time has happened. Since God is eternal, everything is settled. God is an eternal being, meaning that he had no mama, he had no daddy. He has no end. God has always been. The reason why many of us cannot understand what God is because we have mama and daddies that brought us into this world. But God is eternal, meaning that everything in time has already happened. You ever had deja vu? You don't see you had the red shirt <clears throat> in the storefront and you had a dream again? It's, I think and if someone asked me that question. I believe that's when time and eternity glitches. When you see something that you haven't been done, then you actually lived it. Everything that has happened, God is chilling. God ain't nervous. He don't care what's going on with Syria. You know, he ain't, he ain't buzz. Oh, snap, man, she lost a job. Hey, yo, Jesus, yo, ain't, you know, angel, what we gonna do about this? You know, God says, I've already got your life mapped out. Imagine if we was that chill. Imagine if we was that anchored. Imagine, listen, <clears throat> I give this analogy all the time for new people. The chair that you're sitting in right now, did you check to see if the chair will hold you? You never checked it. But we check God like God ain't going to hold us. God, are you sure? I don't know if I want to sit in this chair because, God, I don't know, you know, bro. You, I done saw Jesse in them fall. <clears throat> but, God, but God said, man, if you're in the palm of my hands, no one can pluck you out. Are you rooted in a God who's never changing? Because, ladies and gentlemen, there's a peace that comes. Worrying is offensive to a God who can do anything. When you worry, it's telling God you're not able. The reason why... We waver is because we don't have a clear understanding of this God. If God doesn't change and he never changes his viewpoint on things, in order for your life to be smooth, you ought to consult the Bible and say, God, what is God's views about things? What's God's views on marriage? What's God's views on singleness? What's God's views on money? What's God's views on these different things? When you understand God's views on it, you know he's not going to waver from it, then you know you can bank on that every single time. Number three, God is self-sufficient, right? Why is it important for God to want us and not need us? <clears throat> and for those who's taking notes, his views hasn't changed on sin, the sinner, the solution, the saint, and his supply. What does that mean? God's views hasn't changed on sin. There's consequences with sin. He may love you, but if you sin, see, I tell people, God may save you from your sins, but he doesn't always save you from the consequences. You see what I'm saying? And so people get so caught up, well, shoot, I'm just going to do me. I'm going to live my life. And God said, man, look, I can redeem you, but I can't always redeem the situation. I can always redeem the consequences. That's why in order to make the right choices, consult the consequence of the choice. Because God's views on sin never changes. God's views on the sinner never changes. He loves them. He has a hope for them. Come on in. He has a joy for them. But if that person continues to walk in that sin, there's a hell for that individual. And I tell people, man, people get mad at God. God, why did you, why did you create a hell? I say, why did they create prisons? When you're born, they don't be like, you going to jail, you going to prison, you're not going to go. No, by choice, you go. No one goes to hell who doesn't want to go. Because God is so smart. He is so foreknowing that I tell people, people get mad. They ask me questions like, <clears throat> if God is such a good God, what about the people who are dying of starvation? Or what about the people who was killed in some far off land? I say, do you not know that God is all knowing, meaning that he, no man chooses God, only God chooses you. Jesus said, no one comes unto me unless the spirit of God, unless the father draws them. So what happens is nobody in this room chose Jesus. 
Nobody in this room said, I'm going to sign up for Christianity. No, if you really say, you, have, you remember that moment when you truly repented. You remember that moment when you said, God, I'm tired. And I tell people, if God is so smart, he already made a path to everyone he already foreknows will accept him. So I don't care if a billion people die across these God and reached all the ones he knows is going to accept him. But his views on the sinner and the saint are still the same. His views on supply is the same. God cares about your stewardship. The reason why a lot of things haven't been provided for you or provided for me is because of my own negligence when it comes to stewarding. Why would God give you anything that he knows that you will mismanage? He may own a cattle on a thousand hills. He may be, he has, he said the wealth of the wicked is laid for the just, right? He, the Bible's pure when it comes to his supply, but God says, look, just like Marquita would not give Damien the keys to her car because he's not yet mature enough to drive. The same God would not give you anything if he knows you're not mature enough to handle it. So his views on everything is predicated on who he is and what his will is. Last one. What time is it, Alicia? I know you. 816. Okay, five more minutes and I'm done, okay? Five minutes. I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Self-sufficient. Let's talk about this. Why is it important for God to want us and need us? It's very important. You want somebody to want you, not need you. Need leads to perversion. God says, I want you and I'm okay, but I don't need you because I'm not okay. What does that mean? God is so not full of himself, but he is so content with himself to the point where he says, I don't need you. I used to walk through life and be like, God needs me, yo. Hey, yo, God, we, gonna, we about to do this thing, God. And God told me one day, he said, man, I don't need you. I want you. It's a big difference. When I have a son one day or a daughter, I don't want to need my children. I want to want them. When you have an uncle or aunt or a parent or anyone who needs you, molestation is evident. Rape is evident. When someone needs your affection, need is for now. Want is forever. When you want something, you want it forever. God wants you forever. When you need something, I need some water. You need that water just for now. But God is so self-sufficient in who he is. He says, you know what? I want you to do this with me. And people ask, why did God put prayer? Why do we have to pray for him? God designed a world where God and man can work together. Because God says, you know what, I don't need you to help this to happen. I want you to see what I can do when we do this together. <clears throat> God, is, God in his triune nature is completely okay. He doesn't need us, he wants us. Need leads to perversion. Need leads to obligation. Want leads to joy. Need leads to for now, want leads to forever. The beautiful thing about God being holy is that it puts us in a place where we say, God, I may not be able to be perfect like you, but God, I, you, through your perfect life and through your perfect death, you're helping me to progress. God, so, it's so important for us to know that God doesn't change, that when we're in tough times, we know we have an anchor. We know that for a fact that God brings my, me security, he brings me stability. It's important for me to know that God is self-sufficient because God doesn't need me, he desires me. We don't make him a better God. He's God. He's content with himself. But this God says, you know what? Since I am who I am and me and my triune nature, we are content with who, I, who we are. I want you to be a part. Let's pray when we get right to our exercise. Father God, we thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity you've given me to be able to speak into these great men and women's hearts. I pray, Lord, as we get into this exercise, Father, we'll be able to, to engage even more to understand these different attributes. I pray, God, as they go out throughout their week, God, they'll be able to connect with you like never before. And with that being said, Father God, we love you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Did you guys learn something? Yeah. Took some notes? Yeah. All right, Howard, can you go ahead and count some people?